Now we are officially recording the call. Uh, we will put the the agenda in the slide, in the chat. And um, do you have a popcorn question? I did not come up with a popcorn question today. Annika, did After you? After last month's popcorn question fiasco. I did. Mm. Um, Are you trying to come up with one? I'm, I'm thinking I have thought of one, but I already know the answer because maybe it's something I just want to share. Because so, <laughs> it's a really good story, um, I think. So um, So my popcorn question is, um, is name the, the most interesting conversation that you can share on a recorded Zoom video. Richard, um, um, share about a conversation. What what uh, um, uh, an interesting conversation you've had, or who you had it with, or whatever for um, this past week. Oh so, if there is somebody who you had an engaging, interesting, maybe it's the who, maybe it's the the topic or whatever. But I know all of you people have very interesting conversations. I found that out. I know CJ's not a fan of these these popcorn questions, but we're definitely going to put them on the spot and <laughs> make him share. Um, so while you're thinking of that, um, I will share my story. This morning, I had a conversation with a woman that I met at the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. She is a NASA scientist. So I got to talk to a real rocket scientist this morning. So you're going to watch the launch tonight? Um, yeah. So we're all talking about watching the launch and, and whatever. She's, she wants to run a space-focused um, astropreneur incubator. Interesting. All right. And I am going to tag CJ. Tell us about an interesting conversation that you had this week. Uh, you should meet CJ. Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm going to comment on yours uh, because that was not the first time you talked to a rocket scientist. Uh, in, the, <laughs> in the 80s, I was in the astronaut program for NASA uh, right before the Challenger blew up. Wow. Wow. Okay. Bravo. Okay. Things to know about CJ. Yep. That's excellent. Are you going to call on somebody? You're going to tell us somebody else you had a conversation with. It, either one is fine. Might be frozen in space. <laughs> <laughs> it's frozen in space. Okay. Well, while CJ is frozen. Um, Jeff, have you come up with your your popcorn question? And no, he's shaking his head. Christine, who has lots of interesting conversations, tell us about a remarkable conversation you've had. I'm this back. Week. Okay. Um, cool. So, did you want to add anything else? Because I know you froze towards the end of your share. You thought you talking to me again? Yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to share? Before? Oh, I, I thought for some reason that was an odd amount of censorship by the government. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about my NASA story. <laughs> the irony. Uh, let me see. I I have them all the time. I was actually surprised the other day. I had a uh, a conversation with many people at once uh, from the East Coast in a group that uh, I the group of lawyers and executives who I would have thought were uh, thriving during this time, and uh, there was a lot of uh, commiserating and even crying in the conversation about the current quarantine and environment, mainly for their personal uh, reasons. So maybe for the first time in a long time, they've been uh, engaged in their personal life and they've been feeling the emotions. But I found that uh, very, very interesting. Okay, well, since uh, Christine is uh, on my video, I'll, I'll call on you next. Well, cool. yeah, Cecilia also did that when you were frozen. So perfect alignment. Um, and for those who just joined, yeah, the popcorn question is just sharing an interesting conversation you had this week. Um, so yesterday I was invited to a call um, with the title Labs for Humanity. 
And I think it's I mean, pertinent to this group or in the sense of just like what we're all trying to do through eShip is we see investment in so many different areas and so many different things, whether it be the government supporting large corporations, whether we're trying to champion entrepreneurship and ecosystem building, um, why or where is there an opportunity to create a lab that actually focuses in on how we can focus more on our collective humanity? And know m many of us have different conversations and different constellations of what that touches upon, um, but it was a fascinating conversation with eight people from around the world and um, part of it was like sharing our kind of like hero's journey and just kind of like hearing everyone's different perspectives, um, but then also kind of like what brings us together and why are we all trying to work on what we're doing together. So I think it's just like a nice, um, nice alignment for even just a storytelling group on um, what we're trying to do and what does ecosystem building actually look like. And um, yeah, I think really grateful for Annika and Jeff also joining a call yesterday where we were trying to parse out kind of the stories that we looked up. And so just being more specific, I think about the opportunity we have to tell stories and um, yeah, being able to steward this field around ecosystem building, how to be really clear with the stories that we're sharing to be really specific around having alignment around what ecosystem building actually is. So kind of get answered two questions, I guess, or share two different conversations. Um, I will tag team Miss Annika you um number one i had two that really stand out number one i was um invited by rick Rossi to be on crowdcast yesterday and have an hour-long conversation about ecosystem building and what's your purpose and yada 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 so that was super nice because i always do interviews it was really nice to be on the other side of the table and it was just very hearing yourself say certain things about yourself and about your work and your commitment out loud in front of people is incredibly powerful. And it was, that was fantastic. And then last night I'm, I'm doing a course with Acumen called the path of moral leadership. And we had our first call last night with 280 people. And the, the topic was write down three inflection points it, that changed the direction of your life. And then we went into breakout rooms and shared those with completely random strangers and just a level of vulnerability was like, I'm as extrovert as they come, but talking about that stuff with people who I'd never met before required so much trust and so much being open that it was, that was quite the experience. So I think yesterday just had a lot of that for me, which was great. And with that, I would like to hand over to Richard. Hey, um, hmm, interesting conversation. So this past weekend, um, maybe it was last weekend. Time doesn't mean anything anymore. But um, I uh, produced a live stream for two of my friends that were getting married. We married them in their backyard via live stream. And... They met on OkCupid, and OkCupid like sponsored the whole thing and paid for all of it. But the greatest part about it was their favorite artist is Jason Mraz. So they got uh, they got engaged at one of his concerts. Uh, they like followed his like U.S. tour around and went to like five states last summer to see him. And Mark, um, the guy, he has been to like twenty eight and a half concerts or something. And so we actually got Jason Mraz to send them a, a congratulations video. Like he recorded a video for them and that was amazing. Popcorn Michael. Oh man, I, I haven't thought of an interesting conversation yet. I knew you were gonna pick me too. Can you guys hear me by the way? Yes, you could popcorn again if you want us to come back to you. I think I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know who is already gone because I came in a, a couple of minutes late. Um, interesting conversation. Yeah, I guess I need another minute. Uh, Jeff, have you gone yet? I, I have not, Jeff. but I have come off. So I, I will just default to the one that I had on the previous call when, with Annika. And, and Megan was on there as well. Um, and the topic came up of wouldn't it be cool um, if we as storytellers, ecosystem building storytellers, 
could build shared vision together on what impact on the ecosystem building field a collective coordinated collaborative storytelling effort might have. Uh, it's an interesting topic to explore um, and that's what I'll go with for now. <laughs> um, so Megan, you were on that conversation. You may, maybe you want to piggyback on that uh, or have something different. I'll pop one to you. Yeah, I'm going to um, share something completely different. I had a conversation with an old friend on Friday um, and I have this sort of like part of my personal uh, vision is to um, to help create this network of change makers and to uh, start to be connected with people who are exploring wealth redistribution in innovative and transformative ways around the world. And this friend from a very different part of my life has like is like exploring elements of this and was was basically I was living out this vision in this conversation with this person that I never would have expected that it would have come to pass. Um, and, and part of the conversation is really about um, sharing um, and listening what he's proposing and um, kind of learning about this alternative um, economic structure that he's exploring, but really aligned with this vision for um, compassion being at the core of this new model and um, so that was very interesting and then also just able to express my desire that I, I have this um, the strong desire that I'm going to do my own work around so that I can like be not so attached to it but I I really hope that this time period becomes like this we look back in history and see this as like the tipping point to um, greater wealth redistribution to um, to uh, to an opportunity for true equity and justice and healing to start coming into focus. Um, and so that's like what I'm living into. And it just was like so funny to see this person out of a completely different context and for us to be like totally like resonating on similar visions um, and sharing things in a way that felt very open and um, connected. And also like, of course, this is, you know, this is what I'm, seeking and here it is so that was that was a really great opportunity and i am going to popcorn to jess because i saw you came on the call after me so i know you haven't gone yet yeah sorry everyone i'm a little late here uh thank you for sharing the question so um i guess the immediate one that pops in my head is earlier this week i was talking to my best boss and mentor that gave me my first ecosystem building project back in buffalo um, earlier this week because we both had a call with ecosystem mapping software platforms um, two of them and we were discussing and so i brought up the conversation you know some of these platforms are really impressive and you know, maybe 20 years from now, what happens when ecosystem building, we don't need ecosystem building anymore, and it turns into eco ecosystem maintaining, right? Because I don't know if you're all in the same boat, but in the startup world, there's builders and sustainers. I'm definitely a builder. Um, I get bored with the sustaining. So that's a conversation we had for a very long time of it will be interesting once the mapping, everything gets caught up um, and people share best practices and everything, maybe it will turn into ecosystem maintaining instead of building. So uh, I'm probably getting way ahead because we're just emerging here as an industry, but that was the conversation uh, this week. And um, Beth, did you get to go yet? Beth, would you like to go? little slow on the uptake, sorry. Thanks, Jess. I just want to comment on what you said. I am a firm believer that ecosystem building will never go away. There is so much changing with technology and people changing in and out, and I think we're always going to need to keep our eyes on strengthening and growing our ecosystems. So, no worries. <laughs> uh, interesting conversation I had. An old friend of mine came up from Pittsburgh on, on Memorial Day and he is the CEO of a company called Pit Moss. Has anyone heard of it? It's a Shark Tank backed company in Pittsburgh that um, he was an angel investor and he was invested in Pit Moss. And then the founder, like happens quite often, 
uh, kind of fell apart. So the board decided that they had to convince the founder CEO to move aside and they were going to hire another CEO and they hired my friend Brian, who was again an investor already. He is kicking butt with his company, even in this time. Pit Moss is a replacement for peat moss in planting. And they're going gangbusters. They've been growing every, every year. I think he's been CEO now for four years. So it's so exciting for him, for us to see him um, turn this business around and build it. And um, it, we were talking about who knew, I knew him when he was a CIO and a professor teaching leadership in IT organizations. And we, share, we, we uh, spent time together on a board for our local tall ship and said, who would have ever thunk that you would be an expert in agriculture and growing stuff? <laughs> it's just where life takes you is just amazing. And I'll popcorn over to Lauren. Awesome. Um, let's see. I've been trying to get a lot more involved in the local Kansas City community here for the last, well, year or so um, after moving here. And a conversation I had um, with a woman last uh, this week actually was to learn more about her work as a labor organizer here in Kansas City. And this has always been a real passion for me. I studied organizational development and organizational democracy and democracy in the workplace. And um, one of my big questions essentially is, you know, I was listening to the work that she's doing to organize workers um, who are not facing uh, good job conditions and uh, well, a number of issues, you know, as a labor organizer here in Kansas City, Missouri. But what it made me think about even more deeply is how do we support startups and businesses to create good working conditions? And how, instead of thinking just about the future of work, are we thinking about the future of workers? Because one of the pieces of research that I know from working at the Coffin Foundation is that uh, the rate of new employer businesses, so the startups that actually employ and have a good uh, quality employment has fallen in the US. And so I think that there's a really powerful synergy that I was thinking of when she was talking about not only do we help want to help more startups but needing to think about the quality of labor and employment and the structure of how work works um, not just getting people to start up but the quality of all those things that follow so that was helpful to hear people struggling on the other side uh, because of inequitable business practices um who did not go jeff i don't think you went did you go? I did. I did. So I think we have Michael and we have Eric. Who came in. Oh, okay. I think, but Michael went. Michael passed. Well, I, I, <laughs> oh, you I passed. Sort of, I, I punted, but I thought of something that's kind of interesting and, and kind of relevant. I, I um, had a conversation with someone yesterday and I was reflecting on some work that I did recently in Australia in, in the ecosystem building arena. And I had I'd been sent to a region where there was very little in terms of a startup community, if, if not almost nothing. And I knew that I wouldn't, uh, that I'd discover a lot of surprises. I didn't know what to expect. And um, one of the things that I, I didn't anticipate was the, the degree to which communication channels were consolidated into very few hands. And as we started exploring what the narratives in the region were and how to tell the, the, the right kinds of stories to inspire and attract the people that we wanted to work with, we recognized that we were entirely dependent, reliant on these broadcast channels like the local radio station, uh, a couple of things that were kind of the equivalent of a, like a Rupert Murdoch syndicate type of thing locally. And um, very few other channels. And there wasn't really this, a concept of publishing that was like prevalent throughout the community in general, which I think I just, I take for granted in a place like go to, to Sacramento and you see Jeff publishing stuff about Startup Sac on Medium and in other places. Like they just, like we just do that. And that was not part of their culture in general. So 
we we developed um, some some ways that we would talk about a sh uh, having a share of voice in the community and and how that was distributed and who who held the voice and who owned the channels, and we were working from this this position of there's like three and they're they're completely broadcast and we're we're at their mercy, and and all the people really the locals would would tend to do is just. Um, complain if they were misrepresented by those people who owned the voice in, in the community rather than stepping up and publishing and writing and and so we 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 started down that track and created some new channels and discovered we have to engage with the established broadcast channels to funnel people into our niche channels and start developing our own audience for the startup community and that, that was really an interesting experience to go from like scratch like no channels to your first few hundred subscribers in a few different areas and, and seeing how that would work super early stage um work you know er, very very early startup community work kind of required to do the storytelling because until we had established our own audience we you know we, we were trying to infect the local journalists that owned the channels with our stories so that they would you know feel like they're still doing their own work they're journalists they're reporting they have integrity but they're championing the community in ways that we need them to that was challenging i think with, that leaves eric let's see i'll, I'll unmute and i i'll uh, i thought i was past all this uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing some tech troubleshooting with um, our internet, which has been really spotty. Um, so let's see, I, just a great conversation. Is that what that was? Uh, we, we have a thing at Forward Cities where we're doing these little mini calls with different people who are part of the team. Um, so uh, a fairly newish addition, Simone, is um, she's been added to our communications team, but I found out that she has a background that includes uh, Code for America work in, in Durham and also a lot of good design work around just helping nonprofits achieve what they need to. And oftentimes we know that designers um, sometimes are required to do more than just the design. It's sometimes they're required to help uh, leaders figure out what they're thinking and where they're going. So I don't know, that was just useful. Great. Um, and the one update that I have for everybody, if you've not received your email yet, um, the eShip Summit has been rescheduled to September 15th and 16th. Um, I put that into the agenda as well, just so you have it. Um, and if you've not received an email, just reach out and let let me know where, or I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, thanks for indulging on this conversation because I think it it really speaks to the people that we talk to and the way that we talk to people um, have have an impact on on what we are able to um, to work towards and work on in the ecosystem and so I'm hoping that we teed it up well for just really interesting questions if anybody wants to help um, subscribe I will drop the agenda back in here, but um, but Jeff put together some fabulous questions and um, and I <clears throat> let's see if I can share the poll. All right, so I did put together a poll for you, um, so hopefully oh, you'll get to see awesome. it. That's awesome! I didn't even think about doing that. Okay, and if you will um, if you will vote to let us know. Um, when you think about the future of ecosystem building on a scale of one to 10, do you think it's getting better or worse? And then the follow-up question underneath is, um, is when you think about the future of ecosystem building on a scale of one to 10, how much power do you personally have to shape and influence that future? So um, I will is let- Is it getting better or worse as like it's perception or it's actual work? That's a good Jeff question. <laughs> it's how do you perceive ecosystem, the future of ecosystem? Are we on, is it headed in the right direction? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And it's really kind of, if, if that's still open for interpretation, I'd say interpret it as you'd like. All right. So I've got eight out of 11 of you 
Um, and then once we're done with the poll, then I'll, I want to collate those somehow. And, and so just to, this is just the initial part of a game, a uh, teacher's thinking game, um, in which you take these scores and you do something with them, which that's for another call. But after we score this, I'd like to hide, kind of get people's impressions. Okay, why do you feel that way? All right, so um, I'm done with polling. And, and does that get shared out? I'm going to share the results. Awesome. All right, so on a scale of one to 10, um, I think we're feeling pretty good about this. So 27% are at a seven, but 27% um, are also at a 10, so that's good. Um, and then when you think about how much power you have, um, there's, well, at least we all feel semi-empowered, right? Um, so <clears throat> anyway, I will, I will figure out how I can, um, I don't want to just I screenshot can... this because I don't think Zoom. Yeah, let's yeah. see if we can okay. get a screenshot. Yeah, just screenshot it because um, Zoom doesn't. Okay, so hang on. Better yet. <clears throat> well, while you're doing that, I've, I've got an interesting question. Uh, without divulging anonymity here, I'd be curious to know uh, for those who feel that they have a lot of power, what kind of communities are you in? I'd be curious if, if it was in a small community, a sparse one, a large one. Just curious. Uh, or if you have a, a an independent position or a position at a, an organization that uh, empowers you, what what made what made you feel that you have a ten and a lot of power? That, that I'm very curious to that. So in order so we can track that if if everybody's open to it. So whenever whoever did answer that, say first um, what you the first question. Um, if you think it's getting better or worse, so I can capture it, and then we can go into that uh, why as far as why you have so much power. I'll put myself on the chopping block. I answered 10. I answered high on both of them. Uh -huh. um, I think um, the first question I answered that way, mostly because I see a lot of opportunity right now. Like I see a, a huge window of opportunity. And so I felt that influenced my first vote being high. Um, the second part around my power, I guess the way that I personally view that. So one, I clearly work with an institution where there is a position and I'm on the ecosystems team. So that definitely influences me. Um, and, but I also worked in a position around ecosystem building in the network I worked with before, or we had an orientation around that or at the impact hub network. So I've been kind of in this, cycle for a little while where I'm getting paid to be working um, around this theme. So that does empower me more. On an individual level though, um, I think I feel like I have a lot of creative agency, I guess, in terms of what I can do to local organize here locally in Kansas City and the way that I see those opportunities and the relationships that I'm building. So I guess I just have a stronger feeling that like maybe between the two, between my job, uh, between the networks I've built internationally from my previous career, and then also um, just my sense of where the Kansas City ecosystem is and that it's a little you know, mid-size and uh, there's quite a few people that are thinking about this. Uh, that I guess gives me a stronger sense of power and hope. So Lauren, what was your, the, the number you gave your first, the first question, was it a 10 also? Yeah, I might be like kind of an enthusiastic survey person. All right, so. <laughs> I was definitely between an eight and a 10 on both, you know. <laughs> okay, so who else ranked high? I Cecilia? did, Cecilia yep. did. Go ahead, okay, Cecilia. So no, 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 guys? that's fine, because I, I actually didn't answer, but I would have ranked myself higher. But go ahead, Annika. Oh, um, I think similar to Lauren. I, I want to say I ranked the first one, um, how how positive I am. I think I was an, an eight or a nine. It's amazing, I should remember that. But I, <laughs> um, I think mostly because I am in such a, I'm in a great position to talk to a lot of ecosystem builders from all around the world about what they're doing. We talk very frankly about the challenges. We talk a lot about what they're hoping for. And especially with COVID-19 and this whole notion of um, coming in as second responders and sort of entrepreneurs need us more now than ever. Um, I agree with Lauren that there's great opportunity right now. 
Um, the only reason it's not a 10 is that it's still a very nascent field, that there isn't universal support for what these people are trying to do. I am certainly concerned about the levels of stress and, and just that we still don't quite know how to take care of ourselves and, and step out of crisis mode. So there's a little bit of that. Um, but in general, I think it's, it's on the move and on the rise in how much power I have. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but among those seven design principles of how to build an ecosystem, I think uh, principle number six is storytelling and storytelling in very positive ways. So a community sometimes need to hear their story from someone else and we need to make an effort that these stories are positive and that we showcase everything that's great about them. And I have put myself in a position to do that on various levels. So uh, with social ventures, it's international, with um, unsung heroes, it's national. And then I'm doing a little bit personally, where I think storytelling, what did we say last time, Christine? It was something like storytelling is the glue that holds it all together. Yep. And I'm exactly. just becoming more comfortable with that role. And um, the only reason that was not a 10 is that I think we have a lot of great content, but we're still not getting it out as far and widely. I will be satisfied once we have a standum part in Forbes magazine and each of us is a columnist for some TV show or news reporters along with the Daily Stock Exchange report. Like those, that kind of level of communication is what's missing to be a 10. So I think the work is great. Now we need to learn how to, how to bring it out into the world. So was that also an eight or a nine on your power? I want to say a seven. Seven, okay, thank you. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not loud enough yet. All right, who's next? Anybody else, like CJ mentioned, uh, score highly in, a, in the nine or 10 area? Um, oh, go ahead, Jess. Oh, I just put it in the chat, but um, I think it would be really interesting to build off Christine's question in the beginning, because that's how my brain split it too, is asking, how do we feel about um, ecosystem building as a concept, you know, rating and scoring it as a policy, as a structure, as the next emerging economic development process, blah, 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 versus ecosystem builders, you know, doing the work, the recognition and the support, because my scores would actually be very much different. I think high for, uh, visibility as a concept and, and people using the language and verbiage much more, but very low when I talk to ecosystem builders in the fields getting, um, you know, recognition or support and resources still, even with the concept getting, um, I think, some power and influence behind it. So I think it would be interesting to maybe add that next time to the poll or um, if people want to comment, if they see it separately as I do, maybe not. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so maybe if you took the average of those two, um, if those two are the factors, how would you rate it? A five, <laughs> like still in the, I guess, unchanged because super high for the concept getting more recognized and marketed and language, but still pretty low for the support of people actually in position. So unchanged maybe since the last five or six years. I think we're deep in it. So being deep in you, um, it's understanding and connecting with people who resonate with it. So I think that um, the, to, to piggyback on what Jess said and what Christine shared, it's like the concept of ecosystem building as this meta idea thing and the word ecosystem building, because like everybody's saying ecosystem building. Um, and, and you sometimes want to turn around and go, I don't think it means what you think it means. But, you know, but then, then it's, um, it's at least there's momentum there, right? And then being around the people who get it or, um, or when you're sharing things like sharing the eShip framework and stuff and people go, oh, that's like verbalizing the thing that I had going on in my head. So there's a little bit of more sense making and we're getting better at the languaging, um, which is a really a tribute to 
a lot of you on the call is to be able to verbalize it, um, to to vocal, to add voice to the ideas um, in a way that people are understanding. So that's huge. I know Beth is all about um, universal support and, and how you get that message out. And this group is really integral to that. Um, I think that that feeling like you have the ability and the impact because as you're able to share it, um, and maybe it's just the audience and the connection, so you're reaching the low-hanging fruit, but um, but the circles keep rippling out and, and connecting wider and wider. So, um, so that's my observation. So I would figure I'm about an eight or a nine. I'm a hopeful eight or nine, um, maybe sometimes depending on who you're talking to. It's like, uh, yes, we're back to a five or six, but, um, but then I surround myself with other people who are eight or nines and, and feel like there's momentum. So see, Richard's a good example of that. It's like, oh, Richard, there's this thing. And he goes, oh, I'm signing up for all the calls, right? All the things. I, I, ha I have uh, a thought about ecosystem building going quite well and I, and I just I just now realized uh, where that comes from. Um, I rated them, I think that both of the questions eights or nines. And I suppose I really think that they're nines or tens, but I'm more of a conservative survey person. I don't know why. Uh, one of the things that, that I've got into over, over the last six years is a lot of startup weekend facilitating. I worked for a short time with Up Global before the Techstars acquisition, and I was based in Seattle there, working out of their HQ and auditing the Startup Weekend program, working on it uh, from a project management perspective. And I would travel around the country facilitating events and seeing how the stuff that we're developing is working on the ground. And so over time, I started going back to the same communities multiple times often once a year sometimes twice and there are some communities in the u.s and in canada that i've facilitated three four even five years in a row and so i've got to come in at these intervals where i'm seeing the progress that they've made from a year ago to today and i'm working oftentimes with the same passionate community leaders that i met the previous time and I remember the struggles that they were mired in and, and what they were frustrated about, what we talked about. And they've got, they've, you know, they've overcome all of those challenges and they've moved on to a new set of challenges and they don't realize it so much because they're in the thick of it, you know. And a year later I come in, I'm like, oh, you guys solved all of those things. And now look, you have great relationships with this organization. I remember that was a problem. And now you've you've filled out this part of the ecosystem and people are collaborating. And and so I get to come in and see this, you know, this milestones or progress and that that is true in most communities that I've visited which is maybe I don't know several dozen and and a handful of them uh, including Sacramento like I, I see that in 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 Jeff's area um, just having been there a few times so that I think that's where I get my optimism from is those, those check-ins if, if I can add something here uh, this observation, uh, you know, I came from Silicon Valley uh, you know, after 15, 20 years there. They brought me down to uh, Phoenix, Arizona for Arizona State University's uh, program in 2008. So it's been 12 years. You know. When I first came down, there, there was really nothing going on here. And Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country. Most people don't know that. And uh, we, over the past 12 years, uh, instead of having it uh, be builder versus what was it one maintainer uh, uh, or the other suggestion was uh, evolving. I've actually seen it ebb and flow uh, going between very organic and very distributed to being, uh, I can't think of a better word than monolithic <laughs> around the institutions that drive it and then going back and forth. In other words, when one starts to dominate uh, the others uh, rise up and take over, if you will. And so uh, it, it, you know, in the beginning, uh, the, it was organic because the universities and the economic development agencies 
uh, just weren't set up to do it. And so the uh, community uh, organically organized and created a very vibrant uh, ecosystem that encouraged so many startups. And then the university uh, kind of took on from there to the point where we actually were um, designated number one uh, as far as entrepreneurial growth by Kaufman at one point. And then, however, uh, you know, the, watching this from afar uh, or being in the thick of it, uh, it's a lot of interesting things that happen that I'm hoping that as part of the, these initiatives in ESHIP that we can avoid <laughs> about silos and about positioning, the bad kind of positioning um, for influence and power. Uh, and, uh, and and even going down to what uh, the definition of the of entrepreneurship is and the outcomes. But anyway, uh, the ebb and flow, I, I, I kind of think it's inevitable that it's never going to stay one way or the other. I'm still very um, uh, optimistic about ecosystems here and everywhere else. Uh, but I can say in this ecosystem, I'm uh, about a five or a six as far as my influence uh, in there, even though uh, I was head of the entrepreneurship program at ASU and now am part of the governor's economic development effort in innovation. There's just too many uh, large uh, groups that uh, are, don't want any other one group to set the agenda. I don't have a solution for it, but I think it's something that, uh, that needs to be recognized. Anyway, I'll stop there. That's just my two cents. Anybody else want to share? I didn't score super high per se, like a nine or a 10. I know for the first one I scored seven and the second one I scored eight. And I think a little bit to what Jess has mentioned and then what Sissa is putting out now. I think um, I also recently, I don't know how many of you read Dell's article um, in Intersections. I see a lot of nodding heads. And it's kind of like, um, I guess with eShip or what my observation has been not being in the community as long as many of you have is that at the very beginning, it was kind of like the biggest calling card was like entrepreneurship ecosystem building. So everyone comes in flocks and there wasn't a need to like necessarily get nuance in the definition. But I think over the past few years, there's a need to be specific around, are we talking about high tech, high growth? Are we talking about rural? Are we talking about Main Street? Are we talking about lifestyle? What are the differences that we're talking about? And then how are we still thinking about it from a field perspective? We always come back to the field perspective and how do we integrate how it affects us in our local communities like CJ is mentioning. And so I'm really curious and I think this is um, kind of top of mind from a conversation yesterday with some uh, NRPs and a couple of folks on this call as well. Like we continue to want to lift up the stories of ecosystem builders. How do we be more specific with how we are even thinking about ecosystem building so that folks understand externally outside of our community what we mean by that and being able to have almost like different ways of tagging it or organizing good ecosystem, bad ecosystem, not necessarily that, but just like a different types of ecosystem building. And so I'm really curious because I feel like this group is so nuanced in all the stories that they hear and see in our writing. Um, how that resonates because I feel like this is an important um, opportunity right now to really differentiate and be clear and more specific with what we mean by ecosystem building and what an ecosystem builder's role is. And I think that it influences, like we talked about with Annika, like the glue of how all the other goals kind of get more definition and get more clarity as well. Well, I would love to jump in on that one. Um, I think that First of all, from already what I've heard on this call, I do think that this idea that there's um, multiple roles or types of ecosystem builders, I think that that is um, for different stages and phases of an ecosystem. I think that that's, um, that resonates with me. Um, I think from a lot of the work that, um, can, can everybody hear me okay? My computer is a little glitchy, okay. Cool. Um, you know, I think that the big gap in understanding and creating shared language that I'm seeing is that I think that there's a lot more clarity on what I would what I would generally call entrepreneurial support work, and then connecting that versus 
taking a systems approach or a systems leadership approach in which involves much more uh, focusing on whole systems approaches, network design, uh, working to foster networks of networks. Um, and those are distinct approaches actually. And I would, my understanding of ecosystem building is that it's more in that camp um, in terms of its focus. However, of course, to do good entrepreneurial support, you have to um, clearly be able to network. And so there's sort of a bridge there, but that's where I know, I think it's a wonderful opportunity actually now. And I think that the early, um, early summits, I don't, I think that, that a lot of that was muddled actually. Um, and, and there were people who got the systemic view uh, or who were already operating in that. And then there are a lot of people who were focused just particularly on ecosystem building. I think it's a really good opportunity, or excuse me, just on entrepreneurial support. I think it's a really good opportunity to start to grapple with some of the different types of ecosystem building that we're seeing and to describe that more clearly over time and really just working through it in language and in conversation you know i think that's how we learn not that there anybody has one particularly right answer i second your um definition lauren i i agree based on <clears throat> other ecosystem builders and like the projects i've done um it is way more systems view process view versus resource provider that's a, a very important spoke in the wheel but a part of their job and their process is not trying to consider the whole or cultivate a whole versus um the high level kind of systems op operation kind of focus so i second your clear um defining of the the label in that way well, and I think, you know, maybe Jeff, this is, I don't know how much this group has talked about this, but, you know, one of the things that Jeff and I were really nerding out on when we were working on the playbook was um, just the, the incredible parallels in um, between ecosystem building or what we understood as ecosystem building with other fields such as network, network building. So people who are incredible network weavers um, also with the emerging field of systems leadership, which frankly, I think that it's basically the same thing. We're just focused on entrepreneurship. I mean, but you know, those things will develop over time, but there's a whole incredible field that's being built out around systems leadership, which is, which really looks on paper, like also what we're talking about, but their models and frameworks are very similar. Um, and there were, and, and there were others that we started to kind of map together and say like, wow, it looks like around the world and in communities across the world, people are looking at this new way of working. And we in particular want to be applying it to local economies and entrepreneurs, but there's sort of a general new way of working. And it seemed like those, some of those other um, systems oriented, network oriented, agile, community-oriented way, ways of working were very paralleled, I think, with that, which is distinct from uh, an, an individual support organization or doing on, entrepreneurial support. It's about enhancing the conditions of the entire system and building the relationships that allow that to flourish. And it's a really different way of thinking, you know, but then telling stories about the individuals who are doing that and then looking into other areas other disciplines, you know, what do we have to learn, for example, from people who are doing systems leadership in healthcare or in other parts of the economy who don't use the ecosystem builder language? I'm really curious about that now too, right? Because maybe there's some bigger bridges we can gap in terms of story build or story storytelling in that way too. PJ, do you have your hand up from before or or currently? Who did you call on? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, no, I had it up like 30 minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
anybody else want to share? I, I think it's interesting that this call the, and like the previous two other calls have really, no matter what we start off in the conversation, have come back to this, what does ecosystem mean and what, who are we calling ecosystem builders versus entrepreneurial support? Um, it's amazing how we, we keep coming back to that. Yeah, and I almost want to have a conversation with people who didn't know they were an ecosystem builder and just like bring them together. Like that phrase, I mean, I think we've all had that experience of like being indoctrinated into the vernacular <laughs> that well, we're fun. all connecting with, but really thinking about folks who are on the ground and um, in community. And there's different levels of ecosystem builders too around, you know, what people's strengths and what they're bringing to the table and how people experience and express it. So I would, I kind of, you know, I'd be curious to bring different folks together to start having those conversations to, to see what that looks like and describing more of what they do and how they show up and what they see that their community needs. Um, and then I think as, the concept spreads and we definitely try to include uh, in the different articles that we write opportunities to um, include elements of, you know, the definition of an ecosystem builder just in describing an ecosystem builder's actions without saying this is the definition of an ecosystem builder. Um, but that really, I, I'm just curious about that. I'm curious about what what folks are thinking and doing and how how the definition can be shaped from the ground. Well, I, will, I will say a good starting point is each of the um, shamelessly promoting unsung heroes of ecosystem building. But the first question that all of them answer is to you, what is an ecosystem builder? So I think we have submissions from 25 or 30 people. And so mostly people who have never been to Egypt don't know what it is. And if I had to bet on it, 50% who were like, a what now? Oh, is that what I am? So. Um, we have some data on that, if anyone wants to start. I want to share, <clears throat> I wanna share um, something that was written uh, a couple of years ago. And looking back on a lot of the, the things that I've heard and, and talking about good ecosystem building, bad ecosystem building. Um, and, and I want to hear whether or not this resonates. And one of you will, will probably laugh out loud when I say this. So, um, so there's something about, um, let's see, something about um, greatest criticism of bad ecosystem players is their lack of self-awareness, reflection, and criticism. What troubles me about a number of players in our local ecosystem is their uninspired commitment of doing the same thing as they've always done, and why should that change? Um, they are reluctant to change because their approach is the only thing they know, and they want to stay in this their position at all costs. And they don't question what else is out there, what new approaches have developed since the year 2000. Um, so there's a, a hashtag of one trick ponies, power play, and ostriches. Ooh, that's sassy. That's a sassy article. So that sassy article was written after the 2017 eShip Summit by Annika, who called it out. And it was like, oh, yeah, that that totally like drilled it home for me. That's what's so annoying. And um, and so I appreciate you putting the words to the thoughts that were in my head. So share that link in there in the chat for us. Don't you love when you hear something, you're like, damn, that's insightful. Yeah. So I wrote that a year ago. <laughs> it happened to be on, on Instagram the other day, Annika. No. Um, uh, so we're, we're coming up at the top of the hour. Do, you, do we want to wrap up? Did you have anything, Cecilia, to wrap us up? I did want to think Goal three, there's some people here on goal three who were actually talking about the definitions of that we've been talking about here. I'm wondering if a convening of both par parties from both calls would be good for a, a future call. So goal three, just um, for visibility, goal three, um, which is shared vision, is really working around um, a project team model where they're, they, they're working to put together the first draft of a project of mission, vision, values, so that um, 
so that they can share it out and then have everyone kind of chime in. Um, the, the thought was it would be more useful to have a straw man as opposed to like everybody let's get together and just continue to jam on this thing um, because we could be together for a really long time, um, you know, wordsmithing and nuancing all those things. So um, I think what would be really interesting is, um, is where connected networks go for um, kind of a line in this because storytelling was never really a goal, right? It was conversations, I think really between Jeff and I early on and looking at some of these things and, and, um, and recognizing, wow, storytelling is part of all of these, but it's also the interdependencies and overlaps of all the goals. So, um, and yes, storytelling is the glue. It's what changes hearts and minds for goal five, it's case studies for goal six, it's a PSA. I mean, those are great examples of how each goal has specific ways that they tell stories. So, um, so I would love, um, you know, all of the the things that that go on around this. But, um, but I think goal four would be a really good place to think about it. Or I know goal five could use some assistance in how to tell their stories eloquently because otherwise things really come from a lot of fact and, and data-based stuff, and it's really hard to translate. So um, I, I don't have a call to action. I think that there are some takeaways. What I'd love to explore with everybody is, um, is the opportunity, and we'll talk with the eShip champions that are on the call, about how we can start how having... Start having those interweaving conversations. Um, I think so, those would be great. Yes. Sorry, could I just share, could I just share real quickly? Um, I normally do not offer suggestions without offering help, but um, as we've been brainstorming, Jeff doing the survey and Lauren sharing about looking at um, you know already professions that have been kind of established. Possibly, if you guys wanted to do it, to kind of further along identifying um, the definitions, maybe there might be an idea there to do a survey of once you aggregate, um, Lauren, as you mentioned, you know, being a super connector, all these words that you're identifying that people that are ecosystem builders identify as, it would be kind of neat if you surveyed the whole ecosystem um, community to say, give us the top three or five words associated with your work that you identify or others identify um, of you from the established industries. I don't, I don't know if you guys are already planning it. And again, I don't usually like to recommend doing work if I'm not helping, but just from this call, I, I just was inspired by all the brainstorming. So I think that the, the goal five team, which are, uh, or the goal five group, which are um, basically a bunch of data geeks would, um, would really, it may be of interest, Eric, I don't want to speak for, for the facilitators on goal five, but, um, you know, something like that, but, but that's a wonderful idea, Jess, and, um, and I have, we have an eShip Champions call coming up in the next little bit where um, I I talked about, you know, some ideas around builders and guides and framers and, and all kinds of things. So maybe um, if that's of interest, Jeff, Annika, Beth, um, if we could kind of come up with something around that and share out. Is, it, is there at, anybody else who has? Who I'm has at capacity. Idea? Uh, yeah, sure. well, yeah, um, so supporting in that capacity, um, I, Christine and I can definitely figure out um, some ways that, that the two of us can support in talking to NRPs and, and the eShip community, but um, is there anything, I, I think Jess, it's a brilliant idea. If anybody else has some input or ideas, if they would like to share, please feel free to email. Um, and, um, and 
it looks like Eric will take the lead on, on getting back with the group after he talks with the organizers. Is there anything else that anybody else would like to share? Uh, can I interject two, two thoughts really quickly? I know we're over time, but um, I just want to spit them out. Um, one is with regard to your question about calling out bad ecosystem building. I discovered the most effective way for me to start doing that in my recent experience was to go through a phase first where I earned or asked for the permission to speak into the work of the other people that were working in the same ecosystem. And that looked like forming a group where we were all committed to a certain you know, set of principles or ideals that helped us do a few other things too. We were, as a, as a group, you know, representing all of the different organizations um, in, in the region, doing the gap analysis to figure out who's doing what and what's missing and to find out where we're being redundant, but then also moving that into um, uh, holding each other accountable for the excellence of, of the programs that we are committed to in you know, the overall framework in the ecosystem. And once we established that respect and these principles, then there was room for that conversation about calling out bad ecosystem building. Um, but you can't really do it until you've, you know, determined that someone is interested in better ecosystem building if it's possible. And then the other thought I had was with regard to surveying um, uh, definitions of ecosystem building terminology um, since this is a storytelling call, I want to encourage anyone that's doing that work to do it through a narrative framework. And as you collect the language of the people and the, the emotional and the colorful, you know, ways that they think and talk about the work that we're doing naturally, um, collect the, all of the elements of a basic narrative framework as you're doing that. Ask them to tell you stories about how they think and talk about it. Um, because that's going to power a lot of the ways that we're able to then speak back to those communities in their own language. I love that. That's amazing. It, it sounds like a weaving of what Megan and, and Eric and their Forward Cities team is doing and the storytelling team and all those other things kind of coming together in a beautiful place. So that's a really wonderful note to end on. Um, Thank you, Michael, for sharing that. Um, and thanks to all of you for your time and energy and amazing conversations. Uh, so we'll look forward to continue the conversation in Slack amongst each other. And, um, and let's, let's move this along like we're doing. So thanks. Thanks, everyone.